It's now time to hear our Canadian keynote speaker. To start this presentation, I present to you the Honorable James Peterson, counsel at the law firm of Baskins LLP in their Toronto office, former Canadian Minister of International Trade, former member of Canadian Parliament, and the Canadian co-chair of the Canada United States Law Institute. Jim, over to you. Thanks, Steve. I have uh, three very pleasant duties today. And the first, Steve, is to thank you as our US National Director of Coosley and Ted Perrin as the Managing Director for the truly outstanding leadership you have shown in putting together today's program. Uh, it's a re remarkable one on the Arctic. Uh, second, I want to pay tribute, as Dean Scharf did, to members of our executive committee, starting with uh, Dean Erica Chamberlain and uh, Kai Carmody of Western, and uh, also two very long-term members on the executive committee, Selma Lucenberg and Larry Herman, uh, also, Diane Francis, Peter McKay, and Martha Hall Finley. Uh, and I'd also like to pay tribute to a long-term uh, member, Michael Robinson, who did so much, particularly many years ago in this operation. Uh, I also want to pay tribute to our wonderful US partners on the executive committee uh, who are working uh, with my long-term friend and co-chair, Jim Blanchard. Uh, third, I have the privilege of introducing Joe Colmartin, Council General of Canada in Detroit, serving four states, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. Our Detroit operation is surely Canada's most important. The Canada has invested to 950 Canadian companies in these four particular states. And the Detroit Windsor Crossing is certainly the busiest between the US and Canada. Every day, over 7,000 commercial vehicles carrying over $290 million in surface trade pass through that connection. In Canada's election in the year 2000, Joe Comartin was the first NDP candidate in 10 years to win a seat in parliament from Ontario. He went on to serve his Windsor constituents for over 15 years. Prior to his election, Joe was recognized as a real community leader. And among his many accomplishments was his founding of the Windsor-Essex CAW Legal Services Plan, the largest private sector legal defense plan for working people in Canada. He also played a key role in many other community services including co-op housing and the CAW child care centers. In Parliament, he had a very distinguished career. He became deputy speaker. He was opposition house leader. And he was perhaps best known for his work on issues such as mandatory minimum sentences and making the Environmental Protection Act more accountable. Above all else, he was highly respected for his assiduous preparation for debates and presentations, which three times won him the distinction of being, quote, the most knowledgeable member of parliament, end quote. I had the great privilege of serving with him for seven of my 23 years in parliament and will always remember him as a nonpartisan, highly credible, true gentleman. 
It is my great pleasure and honor to thank Joe Martin, Co Martin for his past and current contributions to Coosley and to Canada and call on him to introduce our keynote Canadian speaker, Peter McKay, who, who like Joe Coe Martin has done so much for both Coosley and for Canada. Thank you. Thanks, James. I really appreciate that. I must admit, I'm, I'm feeling a bit, uh, a bit embarrassed. Uh, though you extol my virtues uh, to a much greater degree than I deserve, but thank you for that. Uh, good morning to all of you. It's, it's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, to join uh, the, uh, the board. I want to congratulate the, the Quisley board uh, for going ahead uh, with the program this year, although virtually. Uh, there's just too many of these issues that you're addressing today that are uh, that need to be addressed on an ongoing basis. So again, I congratulate the board for their endeavors in this regard. Before I introduce uh, Peter McKay, uh, the Honorable Peter McKay, a longtime colleague of mine, um, I'd like to highlight a, a few points of uh, relevance, I think, to the discussion today, uh, but also points that the uh, Canadian government wants to get out on an ongoing basis. And the first one in that regard is on diversity, equity, and inclusion. The government of Canada has made it very clear how determined it is to learn from the events of, 19, of 2020 and to invest in efforts that will address the challenges of inequality. The health and economic crisis brought on by the pandemic cast a bright light on prejudice, discrimination and violence that are a lived reality for far too many people. We recognize that systemic racism and discrimination in Canada continues to be a reality faced by Black, Canadians, Indigenous persons, and other racialized Canadians. Fighting systemic racism, unconscious bias, and discrimination is a top priority for the government of Canada. And this is particularly true as we move into a post-pandemic world. On climate change, despite a year in which the pandemic revealed many pressing concerns, the issue of climate change has not gone away. Just last December, Canada announced a strategy on climate change in the form of a plan entitled A Healthy Economy and a Healthy Environment, Canada's Strengthened Climate Plan. It includes an initial $15 billion in new investments to achieve economic and environmental goals. The plan seeks to cut greenhouse gas emissions significantly by 2030. And there was a future announcement uh, from that uh, just this week by the prime minister. The US and Canada share strong policy objectives around climate change and share the view that we can and must work together with our key allies and partners around the world to address climate change. This brings me back to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Too often in the past, Northerners have not had the opportunity to participate in decisions directly affecting them. The government of Canada is working with the people of the Arctic and the North to develop long-term opportunities that protect Canada's rich natural environment, build healthier communities, and respect the rights of Indigenous people. In September of 2019, the Government of Canada launched Canada's Arctic and Northern Policy Framework. This framework will guide Canada's priorities, activities, and investments in the Arctic to 2030 and beyond. It will better align Canada's national and international policy objectives with the priorities of Northerners. The collaborative work undertaken by the framework partners supports the government's commitment to reviewing Inuit to Crown, nation to nation, and government to government relationships based on a recognition of rights, respect, cooperation, and partnership. I now turn to what my role is today, uh, having set those aside, and that's to introduce the Honorable Peter McKay. I have to say, Peter, you're probably happy that I spent a few minutes because you only gave me so many minutes uh, on, on this because I'm not going to you know, do all the gossipy things and all the backroom uh, 
uh, items that I know about you. Um, uh, I'm going to go and just extol your virtues and your experiences, which are very, very impressive. Peter served in the Parliament of Canada for over 18 years as a cabinet minister, including justice and attorney general. He was the, uh, the Department of National Defense, Foreign Affairs, and the Atlantic Canada Opportunities. So that's like six or seven very, very crucial departments in our government system in Canada. And he, he uh, did a phen phenomenal job in every case, even though, of course, I was a major critic of his on some of the, some of the policies. Uh, he did his job extremely well in every one of those positions. He also chaired the Government National Security Committee for almost 10 years. That was particularly crucial at the period of time when uh, we were still dealing with the, the uh, results and all the security issues after 9-11. Uh, and again, uh, carried a, a heavy load and provided great leadership uh, on those topics. Going back further in his career, Peter started his legal career um, in the province of Nova Scotia as a Crown Prosecutor and worked uh, after that as a general practitioner before he entered politics. Most recently, Peter has joined McInnes, Cooper and Deloitte Canada as a strategic advisor. Peter, um, I think of a number of times in the interactions we had in Parliament and your, your ability to um, remain bipartisan, uh, remain um, strong in your interaction with other members of, of the House. Um, although we often didn't agree on, on specific policy issues, it seems to me you always conducted yourself, and, and this is going to sound maybe a bit, a bit uh, conservative, but that's okay for you, right, uh, as a gentleman. Um, and one that I think uh, your, your family, your constituents, your province actually of Nova Scotia are very proud to see you as a native son. So I will turn it over to you and uh, look forward to hearing your comments. Peter McKay, your turn. Peter, we're, we're not hearing you. Uh, uh oh. Sounds like the troubles I have. Mm -hmm. Martin, uh, try it yeah, now, Peter. He, he, he's unmuted, so not, not really sure if. Uh, Microphone's not working or what the case is, but he's unmuted. So that's all we can do from our end. Uh, Peter, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we're uh, having, yeah, we're having. What about now? Now. Okay. Okay. now we can... okay. All right. Yeah. Terrific. Well, thank you. Sorry for that uh, brief interlude. Uh, it seems to be a daily occurrence and part of the, the challenge that we all live uh, that brings stress and anxiety in addition to uh, concerns around COVID. Uh, let, let me begin by just reciprocating briefly with my uh, fond recollections of having worked uh, in the Parliament of Canada with both uh, Jim and, uh, and Joe uh, and reciprocate uh, their kind words. They were both individuals deeply committed to their constituencies, to Canadians, and bipartisan in the sense that they were there to get things done and to accomplish uh, uh, important initiatives on behalf of all Canadians. And, and I felt honored uh, to work with them and, and to know both of them and, and to call them friends. And so I'm, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to join them uh, and all of the fellow presenters, members, guests of the Canada United States Law Institute, the two deans of these great universities uh, law schools, and uh, via the wonders of technology to join you from the east coast of Canada. As I said, we're, we're in challenging times still, but uh, I know that we're, we're coming through it. Uh, to put some of it in perspective, I, I was speaking with a 99-year-old veteran last week, Merle Taylor from Lock Arbor, Antigonish. Uh, she was a wireless operator during the Second World War, joined in Manitoba and married uh, a young combat engineer, and they moved to Nova Scotia. And she still does Morse code today. And when I was speaking with her, she, uh, you know, she referenced, obviously, 
uh, COVID. And she said to me, you know, uh, we overcame worse. Uh, we came through a much more difficult period of world history and we'll do so again. And, and I'm thinking of her today because uh, just yesterday, Merle passed at the age uh, of 99, just uh, a month short of her 100th birthday. So this year's discussion uh, on the Arctic and the profound disruption, uncertain impact, which I think is, is rightly titled, and uh, we've heard some tremendously uh, insightful comments from very gifted uh, individuals, uh, and I'm, uh, I, I'm somewhat humbled to be following them given their depth of knowledge. I, I've had a long and abiding interest in the high north uh, since my early days. Uh, I first traveled to the Arctic, the high Arctic, at the age of 17. I, I was fortunate to get a summer job on a supply ship with federal operations. Uh, I was on board the Canadian ship Cecilia de Gagne, which sailed out of Mulgrave, Nova Scotia, with a load of dynamite for a mine and some uh, work that they were doing in Greenland and then on into the high Arctic communities. I'd grown up on a farm here in Nova Scotia, so I'd operated a lot of equipment even before I had a proper driver's license. So this was a, a dream come true. Um, being around dynamite and heavy equipment, what more could a young boy from rural Nova Scotia want? And uh, it led to two summer trips to the high Arctic. It was a transformative experience for me. I, I met Inuit people for the first time on those trips. And I found them to be warm and welcoming and so inquisitive and cheerful and wanting to engage. We also had close encounters with polar bears and seals and uh, sub-zero temperatures and heavy ice and all of that incredible weather, much of which was referenced again already early in these uh, presentations. In fact, we got stuck in the ice uh, in the Pond Inlet Harbor on, uh, on the first trip there and had to use uh, helicopters and slings to move the material from the deck of the ship to the port. And we were there until the, the Coast Guard uh, CCGS St. Louis uh, came and, and it was able to break us out. It was, it was by far um, one of the most exciting things that I had ever done then and now. And it was also the best uh, summer job I, I could ever have got because we got one paycheck at the end. And uh, I did the responsible thing at age 18, and I, I bought a sports car, uh, much to my parents' chagrin. I traveled back to some of those very same high Arctic communities 25 years later as Minister of National Defense. Some of the same communities, Pond Inlet, uh, Resolute, uh, Iqaluit, Greasefjord, and, uh, and ultimately we, we went to Alert, which is the highest populated Canadian um, spot on a community in, uh, in, in the Canadian Arctic. It's, uh, it's a Canadian Forces base and very close to, to Greenland. I had a chance to visit Thule, but it was part of annual Arctic operations, Arp, Op Nanook, as it was known, with rotating regiments of the Canadian Forces and Special Forces. And of course, it included local Arctic Rangers. In 2013, uh, just anecdotally, I, I attended a community celebration in Nana Civic and we were in a, a local high school gymnasium and they, they laid out a cultural display, beautiful artworks and carvings and leather goods and uh, paintings that were done by, by local community members. And they had, they had throat singing. They were doing the, these very specialized athletic displays. And it culminated with bringing a, a recently killed narwhal into the gymnasium. And it was... Uh, butchered and opened up and offered to us as a sign of, of welcome. And uh, I was there with General Walt Natinchuk, who I think has already been referenced here today, uh, who was the chief of defense staff, our, our top soldier, and a, a very uh, a wonderful guy, very respected, and, uh, and no shrinking violet, if I can put it that way. And yet when they, they reached into the open carcass of this narwhal and started pulling out pieces of liver and heart and offering them to us, I thought uh, General Natinchik was going to faint. And he started to back away. And I said, oh, no, we're in this together. Uh, incidentally, uh, around that same time, I, I remember being at the Connaught Range in Ottawa uh, as uh, one of our, our visits to Canadian Forces members. And they were having the national shooting competition for the best shot, the top shot in the Canadian Armed Forces. That year, it was won by a young Indigenous ranger. And I remember speaking to him on the range. 
And what was unique about him uh, was, was obvious to everyone. He was there in his very distinct red hoodie as a member of the Rangers. But he was using a, a vintage World War II Lee Enfield rifle. And he was a left-hand shot. Now, everybody else was using much more modern and, and now standard issue C9 rifles, but he was using this Lee Enfield. And I had a chance to speak to him afterwards. And I asked him, how did he become such a good shot? And he told me he'd been hunting since he was four years old with his father, hunting polar bear. And he looked at me with a very stern look and he said, with a polar bear coming bearing down on you, you only have one shot. And uh, I, I always remember that as, as rather chilling, but uh, incredibly impressive. And, and the people of the North uh, should not be overlooked in, in any of this discussion. And, and I'm glad to have heard Joe's opening comments and, and, and commend the current government for their commitment and, and all Canadians for their incredible passion for the North. But it is the people of the North who we have to be concerned about, along with, of course, marine life, all animal life, fauna, the delicate, delicate environment that it is. But that uh, has to be front and center in all of these discussions. And as citizens of Canada and the United States, uh, I think we have sometimes different expectations of our country. In the North, their expectations, sadly, are very low. And, and that must change our ability to offer support, their ability to communicate. So we need more satellite coverage. We need broadband internet connectivity, which is hugely challenging given the vastness of the territories. Low satellite connectivity offers, uh, offers hope. And there is, of course, enormous two-way benefit to approaching the Arctic, not as an obligation, but as an opportunity for government, for jobs, for connectivity, and, and for the greater good. Uh, it is, of course, also incumbent upon all of us, and this is woven into all of the discussions today in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions reductions, our commitment to combat climate change. And the way of the world is, of course, for young people to see in their leadership greater commitment to the collective good, including combating climate change. I would suggest as well one of the other components uh, necessary through this connectivity through technology is telehealth and telemental health, which will help to address the disproportionately high suicide rates in northern communities. Indigenous communities have, in fact, been losing a lot of their talent, despite the fact that many of the young people who choose to leave have a, an incredible desire to go back, but they're unable to do so because of lack of employment opportunities lack of infrastructure on reserve, and, and even, as we've heard, uh, tragically, lack of uh, fresh water uh, and, and ability to have real nutritious foods. So infrastructure deficits, uh, connectivity deficits uh, run in the billions of dollars, and it's imperative that collectively, and I, I can't speak specifically to Alaska, but I know in our territories, we have to unleash the capacities of northern Indigenous communities by installing some of these critical infrastructure pieces, including, as I mentioned, high, high, in, high speed internet. Uh, and this has been noted time and time again by, by many, uh, and, and many studies have, uh, have highlighted this fact. By 2030, indigenous communities will make up about 7% of the labor force, uh, and yet they are still very underrepresented in Canadian businesses. And this gap in employment rates between indigenous and non-indigenous is again an area that has to be addressed and has resulted in disproportionately um, low wages for those who do come south and, and work uh, among southerners as we're referred to in the arctic and data has showed continually that indigenous workers were among those most likely to be employed in jobs where they are expected to decrease and least likely to have growing opportunity in those occupations and so again reskilling Operate, offering these opportunities to, uh, to advance part of the, the imperative, moral imperative that our countries face. I, I would be, of course, extremely remiss if I didn't reference on, on the, the issue of climate, where I, I saw with my own eyes in, in that intervening period, the significant environmental changes that had occurred in the intervening time between my visits as a, as a young Canadian and going back later as a minister of government. Many of the bays that we had been in 
which had been packed with ice, where we were trapped in ice, were now open. The terrain around the communities, which had been hard as concrete from permafrost, was now blooming and, and alive with, with colorful new growth. And, uh, you know, the, the, the stark images that you see in, in, in uh, pictures and, and some of the maps and, uh, and, and the graphs that we were shown today could never do justice to the, the incredible, breathtaking beauty of the Arctic. And, and particularly in the summer months, of course, when you can see things because of the pitch black that envelops the Arctic in, in the winter months. But it, it is really something that I, I feel so blessed to have seen. Very few of our citizens, and, and I would suggest very few Americans, will ever see the North. And yet there is this instinctual connection that we feel, certainly in Canada, uh, for the North. I, uh, I know that we have to do our part. Um, clearly, that includes, and it would take a, a much more concentrated discussion, which we had at our last uh, QSLE gathering around what those steps are in terms of lowering emissions and fewer flights, less, less emissions generally. And we, we've heard from Danish colleagues and, uh, and those who have participated here of what they're doing individually to address uh, the reduction of the carbon footprint. Uh, Dr. Eichen referred to this. And certainly the Arctic, and this perhaps is a, a penetrating statement of the obvious, the Arctic are feeling the most drastic impacts of climate change and yet they are collectively as a population, which is only 1% of the Canadian population, although 40% of our land mass, but our Arctic populations are not uh, huge contributors at all to climate change. And yet they are feeling the worst effects of this. And so it increases, again, um, everyone's collective knowledge and responsibility that we're having these discussions. I listened to a Canadian colonel, Chris Hadfield, an astronaut who uh, is known to, to many. Uh, he commanded the International Space Station, was renowned as being part of, of NASA. And he has spoken passionately about his observations from outer space of the Earth. And from that unique vantage point, being able to actually see the impact of human climate change versus natural climate change. But having observed it from outer space, that, uh, that creates, again, a very powerful image of how real and how impactful this challenge is. And, and science in the North is challenged, um, as many have referred to, even in the sense of mere survival. It's dark, it's dangerous, uh, it's incredibly cold, it can hit temperatures of minus 60. And many of the efforts to catalog and study and do the research necessary are, are quite restrained by those obvious conditions. But the understanding and the establishment of, uh, of what needs to happen has increased exponentially. And many of those who are gathering here today have made it their life's work. It also, of course, and this has been part of the discussion, impacts directly on our country and our sovereignty in ways that we, we have to be concerned about. And we can fulfill and, and continue to work towards these global commitments of obligations to reduce uh, global warming and its impact, but we've and we've heard a lot about uh, renowned experts who've given us real insight into what that means. Especially things like I loved the presentation on the on the seven C's because I think it it lays it out in uh, in great detail, but in in simple, understandable, uh, bite sized pieces as to what we can do. And with those changes in in the Arctic ice and the land mass and the accessibility of the water and the potential changes geopolitically, um, we need to resort to, to further expertise outside of government in many cases. Uh, and, and yet, having said that, we know that the race for the North began in earnest centuries ago. It's, it's worth noting that uh, this, uh, this has been this challenge in terms of how we operate in the Arctic has been with us for a very long time, uh, centuries, of course. One sort of quick Note is this idea that the opening of Arctic ice, the, 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 the melting, is going to make it easier to navigate. Not necessarily so. There's a precarious nature of floating ice that is far more uh, threatening in many ways. And, uh, and I'll refer to that in a moment, a, a story I recall about uh, someone trying to navigate the, the internal Canadian waters. And, and it has 
attracted in some ways adventurous boaters. And we, we heard uh, a reference earlier about the Kiwi role. Um, it does take significant search and rescue challenges to be able to respond to these recent events of, of adventurers uh, and commercial uh, exercises to circumnavigate um, the, the polar ice. I, I made a historical reference, and that is that the, the, the Franklin expedition, uh, which I think left England in the 1840s, was seeking this Northwest Passage, and they found it. And then winter found them. Uh, there was 120 on board, all perished eventually. They were stuck in the ice for about two years. And it, it speaks to the perils that are there, uh, the harshness, the danger of the region. Uh, it captured people's imagination literally for over 100 years, 200 years now. And, and it, uh, it, it, it also speaks to the, the imminent danger of, to quote Stan Rogers, tracing one warm line through a land so wild and savage. I, uh, I recall uh, being briefed at the Department of National Defense about a, an Australian adventurer. He was an ex-military member himself, a special forces operator, and he tried to navigate a small vessel through the Northwest Passage, and he capsized. Luckily, as part of his preparations, he had brought a beacon with him, and he was able to get out of the water and, and curl up in a wet sleeping bag and, and a tent, and he hit the beacon, and there were Canadian Forces members, our search and rescue dispatched out of uh, Canadian Forces Base Goose Bay. And, and when they arrived and found him uh, in a very uh, precarious position and uh, uh, facing frostbite and a certain death, uh, they, they got up, they clambered up on the ice and, and they found his tent and they ripped open the door. And there he was. And, and uh, I, I don't know what the search and rescue uh, system is in Australia, but the first thing he said was, he said, I don't have any money. To which this Newfoundlander uh, aviator who was uh, on the on the Cormoran helicopter said to him, you don't need, need any money, by you're in Canada. And it it made its way through the, the forces as a sort of a, a bit of a, 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 you know, a symbol of, of this great uh, search and rescue capacity that we have. But uh, the dangers and, and the perils that can befall people who try to navigate through the Arctic. The people who've lived there for centuries, of course, know firsthand, and uh, they know what the response needs to be, and they have the most intimate knowledge, and we should listen to them. In fact, if we had listened to them, Parks Canada uh, would have found the HMC Airbus and Terror um, perhaps a lot sooner, uh, and the 170-year mystery is still unfolding, but it was the Indigenous people who were able to point to where those ships were going to be located. I'm going to close out my remarks by talking a little bit about the challenge of defense and security. And there's been a great deal said on this already, uh, and it's coupled with the the fragile environment and uh, and the unique environment itself that it it entails. But Canada's commitment, of course, to enhance ice breaking and its fleet is a big part of our ability to have a presence and exercise sovereignty in the north. It's a, a practical, prescient investment to have Arctic offshore patrol vessels, which, which are armed. Uh, Canada is building a, a much larger icebreaker to uh, replace our current icebreaking capability. The, the, uh, uh, the ship will be known, I believe, as the uh, Diefenbreaker, if they haven't changed the name. Um, that's a reference the Canadians may get. Submarine capability, of course, with uh, quite antiquated diesel electric uh, ships are, are not suited for traveling in the Arctic night, Arctic uh, waters. We can't compete with nuclear subs, to say the least. And of course, having the capacity to land aircraft uh, and recover perhaps some of the, the northern airstrips is something that we, we should be doing. Uh, we have some capability to land large transport aircraft there who can also be critical in, in opening up more supply chain and, and being able to deliver important goods to, uh, to Arctic communities outside of the seasonal supply ships that go. And so equipment is, is essential in, uh, in our effort, not only for national defense, but for practical considerations of travel, support, search and rescue we've touched on. Thankfully, we have a neighbor to the south 
who we share this collective responsibility with, and we've, we've heard reference already to NORAD, um, but also our work with the U.S. Navy and the, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard uh, buttress our ability to project our sovereignty, uh, to solidify greater defense capability, and to, to push back on what the appetite and, uh, and what the ambitions might be of countries like Russia and, and China. Um, and, and I'll come back to that in a moment. The, the U.S. relationship with Canada, as we know, and, and we could extol the virtues of that relationship, we, we, we have the best uh, relationship bilateral in the world, in the planet, in my estimation. And the U.S.-Canada military relationship is perhaps one of the best examples of that and is the centerpiece of our ability to protect North America, its territorial boundaries and its waterways. And while we have some friction from time to time, and um, there's been reference to the Beaufort Sea dispute and UNCLASS at the United Nations, um, the definition of the internal waterway in the Canadian Northwest Passage will be decided. And I'm confident uh, ultimately it will be resolved according to the rule of law. More importantly, the shared commitment to protecting and promoting joint efforts of defense and research and preservation of sovereignty uh, between our countries is, uh, is as strong as it gets. Now, Russia recently made claims, again, it was referenced to uh, some of the disputed territory around the, the shelf and, uh, and, and the polar cap itself. I recall during my tenure as foreign minister that they famously planted flags on the ocean floor. Uh, and I pointed out it was no longer the 17th century where you could go around making those type of claims, which quite severely irritated the then foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. Well, fast forward uh, almost 15, 20 years, and uh, he's still the foreign minister, uh, which says a little bit about uh, their system. Um, certainly more job security for government ministers in Russia. While we have the, the quarrels from time to time with the U.S., we are very much in, uh, aligned when looking at the external threats. And uh, whatever the, the disputes may be between our countries from time to time, uh, we will always overcome those interests when it comes to the defense and security of North America. And one has to be hopeful. Uh, clearly, we have uh, a generation more educated, more connected than at any time in world history. Uh, and I know that the, the challenges in the Arctic pose one of the, the great challenges of, uh, of this generation with the, the change that is occurring there. Digital information gathering, artificial intelligence, the, the Internet of Things, uh, I mentioned low orbit satellites. All of this, I believe, is going to help to unlock some of the great challenges vis-a-vis -vis the Arctic. And today we have a generation more tech savvy than at any time. And uh, similarly, this will help us combat things like COVID in the future and, and future threats to human health. The, the digital infrastructure and the, the connectivity that our countries share, uh, the high costs of being able to operate in the Arctic by necessity brings us together, not just with the United States and North America, and many references have been made to the Arctic Council, um, but the profound disruption and impact is deserving of our attention collectively. Many, uh, many around the world are focusing on how to combat climate change, but there are other threats as well. And uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll turn a little bit of my attention, if I might, before I close out, uh, to what is happening in the Arctic vis-a-vis -vis Russia, which is an Arctic nation, a North American neighbor we sometimes forget, although we can't see them from here. It is uh, very much a, an Arctic nation with a large population, the largest, enormous infrastructure, a very capable military that has uh, a presence, a, a much larger presence than perhaps we care to admit in the Arctic, which has been ramping up over the last decade. China, for less obvious, but perhaps more alarming reasons, is dramatically increasing its presence and capability. They've been uh, making investments in, in Arctic countries and in infrastructure uh, the way they have with the Belt and Road Initiative. And our, our Danish uh, Rear Admiral mentioned this in his remarks as well. And so we ask the obvious question, what are the strategic implications of China's activities? And could they take on a military dimension? It's not likely. I think they are far more apt to be involved in, in cyber attacks and perhaps looking at pernicious ways to shut down critical infrastructure. 
Although China is a, a, an observer nation in the Arctic Council, and I recall there were many misgivings about that. In fact, uh, Leona Glukak, who was under consideration to give this speech, uh, was our representative in government on the Arctic Council and pushed back very hardly, uh, very hard, I should say, against uh, Russia's representations on behalf of China at the Arctic Council to have them join as a near Arctic nation, uh, as it was referred to. It's worth noting that they're about 3,000 kilometers away from the Arctic, and there are very few icebergs off the coast of China, although they're building icebreaking capabilities in addition to aircraft carriers. And so, um, geopolitically, what they have done from Africa to Afghanistan to Antarctic is uh, buy up capabilities, um, invest in infrastructure, and of course, in many cases, extract important resources. The strategic location um, of Russia vis-a-vis -vis the Arctic and their naval capability uh, is something that we have to be aware of as we are aware of their aircraft who very often come up to but don't necessarily enter Canadian airspace. We are part of NORAD and the response of course is that joint command that um, comes from Colorado Springs but Canada is in need of new modern fighter aircraft to hold up our end of the bargain. Uh, I believe there is one choice for this and, and this isn't the place to debate that, but Canada has delayed making that decision just as they delayed, in fact, uh, the decision around our 5G network, which has implications for our Five Eyes community and our participation in sharing of intelligence. I'm, uh, I I'm aware that I'm getting to the end of, of my time, but I know that uh, we've talked a little bit about how China and Russia have worked together uh, in building ice capable uh, LNG tankers and how Costco and Soviet Comfort have worked together to increase their ability to transit through that Arctic passage. It's interesting to note uh, what we saw happening in the Suez has even furthered people's understanding of the, the value of the supply chain extension that would go through the Arctic waterways. And so we have a lot at risk and uh, we have a lot uh, in play. Um, just in terms of the resource side, there's estimates that there's $90 billion worth of undiscovered oil and gas in, uh, in the Arctic, which again, although fossil fuel, we, we are stemming our appetite for this, um, it is there. Uh, the sheer cost of perhaps extraction would uh, deter anyone from going down that path. It, the expanding research capabilities of uh, adversarial Arctic countries is, uh, is also something to keep in mind um, to encourage us in that direction to keep up our commitment to, to Arctic research and development. One way that Canada has been doing it is to share facilities in the Arctic and make the type of infrastructure investments around deep water refueling stations, not just for military purposes, but for civilian and, uh, and other government department uh, vessels as well. Working with countries like Denmark, uh, of course, and uh, the Danes, uh, working with all of our Arctic uh, allies is an important part of, of how we collectively um, make good informed decisions around the Arctic. And sharing research, of course, is, is part of that. The, uh, the pushback on the Polar Silk Road Initiative is, again, uh, something to keep very much in mind. And, you know, the, the Western response uh, collectively to what is happening, I think, necessitates that we up our game, uh, including the, the modernization of what used to be called the dew line. So an early warning system, again, that, uh, that several have referenced here today. The significance of, of other investments by other countries, of course, is something we always gauge. Being part of NATO requires that we hit a certain standard, which we haven't achieved uh, in, in recent years of 2% of our GDP. And yet it is worth consideration and something that has never really been tabled in Brussels at, uh, at the Alliance uh, discussion, but that is what the NORAD type investments necessary here uh, would mean in the calculus of reaching that 2%. It's something that I've, I've contemplated of late. Uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of the 
NATO members, of course, have uh, little interest in the Arctic. Uh, and yet, as we've seen by the, the incredible undertaking of uh, the conflict in Afghanistan and an out of uh, area operation, which we hope will never happen in, uh, in a place like the Arctic, does necessitate, though, certain investments in terms of military capability. Uh, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, uh, I know, called out China at a, an Arctic Council meeting not that long ago. And uh, that was for some of their aggressive action and, and intentions, stated intentions. Um, a summit, a NATO summit in, in 2018, I believe, confirmed that some of the, uh, the joint forces command uh, out of the United States and the focus around the Atlantic also takes in part of the Arctic. So we're, we're seeing a recognition in military circles of the collective responsibility. And I, I note that the United States Defense Secretary at the time uh, when he was appearing at the Halifax Security Conference in 2014, unveiled an Arctic uh, strategy that included uh, references to the Navy's second fleet and work along our, our coastlines, collective coastlines, that included exercises in Arctic waters. So the military component of this um, has received uh, natural attention, and I believe it will more, it will receive more in the future, uh, like the receding ice and the snow and the climate changes discussed. The political and security dynamic is in significant evolution and will require careful calculation to avoid disaster of any kind, uh, environmental, uh, human or military. And so the Canada-US efforts to work together uh, along with our Arctic allies is perhaps the most critical component or ingredient of those seven C's. The, uh, the dictatorial leadership, the recklessness and the ruthlessness that we've seen from Russia in terms of their annexation of Crimea, which was also referenced in Ukraine, um, speak to the, the troublesome weight of democracy sometimes that requires much more input, consultation and collaboration. And yet it's a, an essential component of, uh, of our life and our human existence, and one that is a reminder of how stronger we are when we take on these enormous challenges like climate change and the defense of the Arctic together with our global commitment and collective wisdom. And so I think one of the takeaways that I would like to leave with everyone is this call to action to continue to focus on uh, this, uh, this enormously important part of North America. I'm thrilled that it made it to Cusley's agenda and will help shine a light on this important need for action and, uh, and involvement. And uh, while we know 2030 is not that far off, my friends, we have uh, a chance to shape what climate change debates look like, and more importantly, what action will be required for all of our countries and for all of our people and everything that is at stake. I thank you all very much again for the invitation, the second invitation I've received uh, to speak at this forum from this platform. And I'm, uh, I'm very grateful to all who are in attendance. Uh, be well, be safe, take care of yourselves and each other. Thank, thank you very much, Peter, for your meaningful perspective on the Arctic in the context of U.S. and Canadian relations, as well as with the rest of the world. Awesome presentation. I also want to thank Jim Peterson and Joe Comartin for their outstanding introductions. It's now time to take a break before we return to the awards presentation of the Canada-US Law Institute. We're going to take, uh, well, we're not, <laughs> we're not gonna take as long as I thought. I think we're gonna take a six minute break. So be back at 12.35 PM. Thank you, everyone.